Good morning. Well, the first thing I want to do is to wish you all a very happy new year. And here we are, the first day of 2023, and we've gathered to worship. And there's no better place to be than in God's house today. So you're all very welcome, especially those who are visitors with us today. And there's really just one announcement uh, this morning, uh, and that's uh, just uh, a word of thanks from Alex to everyone who helps with the Children's Church Rota. Your help's very much appreciated right through the year. And a new rota has been put together. And uh, I don't know, are there more helpers needed, Alex, is there? Very much welcome. <laughs> so if you'd like to help with Children's Church at any stage going forward, please speak to Alex after the service. We have gathered to worship God. Let's unite our hearts in prayer. Let us pray. Living and eternal God, on this first Sunday of this new year, we come to praise you conscious that you have watched over us in the months that have passed by. We praise you for the countless ways we have experienced your love, the faith you have nurtured, the strength you have given, the guidance you have offered. We praise you for the good times we have enjoyed, the fellowship we have shared, the encouragements that have been. We thank you for the ventures that have begun, the successes we have achieved, and the dreams we still have. Gracious and merciful God, you have always been by our sides, your love constantly surrounding us, your hand supporting us, whatever we have been called to face. We ask now that you would grant your blessing on the days that lie ahead. Help us to make the most of the opportunities that lie before us, to live each day to the full, and to stay faithful to you through good and bad, serving Christ in all we do. Father, you have blessed us in so much that is past. Teach us to trust you for the future, for it's in the Saviour's name we pray. Amen. We stand to sing our opening praise, Amazing Grace.
Let us pray. Loving Father, we praise you for all you've done for us in Christ. And thank you for the many ways that you've blessed us. And we present this offering now as an expression of our gratitude to you for who you are and what you mean to us. And pray you will receive it and use it for the extension of your kingdom and the glory of your name. Amen. So at this point in the service, I'm going to invite the Reverend Jim McCaffin to join me here at the front. Jim, you want to come up here? So, good morning to you, Jim. Good morning. So, we all know Jim here in Darrowmore, and it was a great delight for Gillian and me whenever we came amongst you just over a year ago and discovered that Jim and Alison were worshipping here. And it's been great to renew fellowship together, and there's been a few meetings over coffee, haven't there, Jim? Yes, one or two. And we hope to do a few more of those going forward into the new year. But I'm delighted to say that after much prayer and consideration, uh, we approached Jim with the possibility of becoming a pastoral assistant to myself, and I'm glad to say that uh, the Kirk session were unanimous on that appointment, and most of all, Jim, you agreed to come alongside me to assist with the pastoral visitation. Yes, Alison and I were unanimous too. <laughs> <laughs> so today, really officially, we're, we're welcoming Jim as our new pastoral assistant. So I'm really just going to pray for Jim now as he takes on this new role. So let us pray together. Loving Father, we bless you for your servant Jim. And we pray, Lord, that as he takes on this new role of assisting me in pastoral duties within the community, that you will bless him. And indeed, Lord, you will make him a blessing. We thank you, Lord, for his faith in you, for his lifelong service as a minister. And we pray that you will continue to use those gifts as he seeks to reach out to those in need within our congregation. So we pray you will bless him abundantly and that you will use him and make him a blessing to all he visits over the coming days, weeks, and months. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank the you. Lord bless you, Jim. So there, is, there will be children's church today. The young ones will be uh, glad to hear. But before the children go out, we're going to sing their hymn, I'm Ready to Go.
Our scripture reading this morning is found in Luke's Gospel, and I'm going to invite Sam to come and read for us from Luke 2, from verse 39. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth, and the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the feast, according to the custom. After the feast was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me, he asked. <coughs> didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they didn't understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor of God and man. Thank you, Sam. We're going to continue to worship God now as we stand to sing our next praise for all you have done for us.
Let's bow for a moment in prayer. Loving Father, we praise you that you are with us by your Spirit. And we pray that you would lead us now, as we take time to reflect on your word, that we would hear you speak clearly into our lives and enable us to respond in the best way, in faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, after the big build-up, 2023 has arrived, and with it has come the opportunity to look back on the year that has just ended. And as some people have reflected on perhaps past failures, many will have decided to make some adjustments to their lifestyle, behaviour, or approach to life. And among the most popular New Year's resolutions will be spending more time with family, getting physically fit, developing healthy eating habits, developing new interests perhaps, becoming more organized. I know that's something I need to do. The list goes on. These are all very commendable, of course, but I'd like to suggest another resolution for the year ahead. It relates to our commitment to Jesus Christ and his church, and it's simply this, to follow the master. Follow the master. As I'm sure you all know, the first Christians were called disciples, believers or learners, that is, who were committed to following Jesus Christ. On at least three different occasions, the Lord described discipleship in terms of following. In Matthew 4, we see him invite the fishermen to follow him. He says in verse 19 of that chapter, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And later on in Matthew's gospel in chapter 9, verse 9, he says to Matthew, the tax collector, follow me. And concerning the cost of discipleship, Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. After his victory over death and the grave, Jesus said something to the apostle Peter with the aim to encourage him to focus his interest and energies on the single task of following. When Peter asked Jesus about the fate of one of the other disciples, Jesus said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. To follow Jesus sincerely is a task that only someone who's truly committed to him would attempt. It's only natural that the sincere believer will ask, what does it really mean to follow Jesus? Now, it's not possible for us to explore the answer to that question today, but in the time we have, I want us to consider some of the things that following Jesus involves. And as we do that, we'll see that it really, if we really want to follow him, we must develop a program or strategy for personal spiritual growth. The first thing to note from the verses we read in Luke chapter 2 is that Jesus himself grew towards maturity and effectiveness. He grew as a child. In verse 40, it says, The child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Jesus grew physically, he grew spiritually, and he made progress mentally. And then from verse 52, we see that he continued to grow as a man. Luke tells us Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. If it was necessary for Jesus to grow and develop, then how much more for those who claim to be his followers to grow also? To fully appreciate the need for such growth, we must first understand that a spiritual birth produces a, spirit, a spiritual infant. A spiritual birth produces a spiritual infant. Some people have the mistaken idea that when you give your life to Christ, when you become a child of God, that you're the finished article. But that's as absurd a notion as it would be to say that a baby is born fully grown. When someone experiences conversion, they receive a twofold blessing, the forgiveness of sin and a spiritual life. As a recipient of new life from above, as a partaker of spiritual renewal through the miracle of the new birth, the new Christian is now in a place where growth towards spiritual maturity is not only a possibility, but an absolute necessity. 
There are certain imperfections in young children that growth and time alone can remove. And so it is with the child of God. It's important that we grasp this. If new converts are to be spared the despair that can come through their failure to practice fully the new faith that they profess, the older and supposedly wiser followers of Christ among us need to make sure that we encourage young believers so that they're not bogged down by feelings of inadequacy. Helping helping them to see the Christian life uh, as a marathon rather than as a sprint can do a lot to help young Christians along the way, encouraging them to put their failures behind them and strive towards a more fulfilling, victorious life. We need to be less inclined to be critical of the imperfect steps and ineffective witness on the part of new converts who, as spiritual infants, are still young in the faith. And sometimes we just have to stop and think back to when we first came to know the Lord as our Savior and how we struggled and all the mistakes we made. And then we'll be a wee bit more understanding of other young Christians when they make those same mistakes. The scriptures are clear about the effort that's required for spiritual growth. The apostle Peter told those who were new to the faith, therefore rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk so that you may grow up in your salvation. Both the church, composed of older spiritual brothers and sisters in Christ, and the new convert have an obligation in the matter of spiritual growth. A spiritual birth produces a spiritual infant. Therefore, there is the necessity for spiritual growth. As earthly parents seek to make adequate preparations and ample provisions for the coming of a new baby, so our Heavenly Father has made adequate provisions for the growth of his children. Our Heavenly Father has provided us with spiritual food. One of the first needs of newborns is nourishment, and it's the same for new converts, both old and new. The truth of the word of God is spoken of as both the meat and the milk by which God's children are to to nourish the growth of their souls. Paul writes to the believers in Corinth, Brothers, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. And the writer to the Hebrews says, In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk being still an infant is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Our Heavenly Father has provided us with spiritual food and with the opportunity to learn. Not only does God's word provide us with nourishment, but it's also the means by which we receive helpful helpful instruction and necessary guidance in the way that God wants us to live. As Paul puts in his second letter to the young pastor Timothy, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God and indeed the woman of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The only solid basis on which we can build our lives is to both hear and apply the words of the one that God appointed to be our infallible teacher. Addressing the crowds of his day, Jesus said, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Our Heavenly Father has also provided us with spiritual shelter. What the home is to children, the fellowship of the church is to Christians. And we must never neglect the privilege of regular public worship if we want to grow. As it says in Hebrews 10 verse 24, And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing. But let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The need for the Christian to attend the place of worship is illustrated by the life of our Lord himself. Here are two examples from Luke's Gospel. 
In chapter 2, we read of an incident that occurred when Jesus was still a child, a boy of 12. His parents took him to the Passover feast in Jerusalem, as was the custom. But after the feast, they headed for home, unaware that Jesus had stayed in Jerusalem. Some people might think that this is an example of parental neglect, but it was the normal practice in those days for folk to travel as a caravan or convoy of people. There was also the practice of women and small children going on ahead, with the men and older boys following. So it's possible that both Mary and Joseph thought that Jesus was with the other. When they realized he was missing, they returned to the city, and after three days, they found him in the temple courts. The anguish of his parents is understandable. And although we're told that Jesus returned home with them and was obedient to them, he had set out a marker. One of his priorities was to be in his father's house. Later in his gospel, Luke tells us when Jesus was an adult, he went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as was his custom. And he stood up to read. Jesus didn't neglect the opportunities to worship, study, and have fellowship that the synagogue provided as he grew towards maturity. And if we want to grow in our faith, we will not neglect the opportunities of worship, study, and fellowship that the church offers us. This is the spiritual shelter that God our Father has provided us with. He provides us with spiritual food, the opportunity to learn, and a spiritual shelter. And what are some of the benefits of spiritual growth? Well, to begin with, the spiritual growth of a Christian pleases our Heavenly Father. He loves to see us make progress in our journey of faith. As an early father delights to see his child grow and develop physically, mentally, socially, and spiritually, so our Heavenly Father rejoices whenever he sees us grow towards spiritual maturity. Another benefit of spiritual growth is that it makes us It makes effective service possible. An infant can only do the work of an infant. It would be sad if a fully grown adult was only capable of doing only what a small child can do. But it's tragic if a Christian remains a spiritual infant who never fully develops into a mature believer. An added benefit of spiritual growth is that it brings great personal satisfaction. When we were children, the evidence of physical growth brought us great delight. The same is true concerning spiritual progress. We began by thinking about New Year's resolutions. Have you made any? Have you chosen something that will really make a positive difference in your life? Are you sure you're striving for the right goal in 2023? Certainly there's value in developing a healthier lifestyle, becoming better organized, etc. But for the Christian, there's a clear goal worth pursuing, and that is spiritual growth. As Jesus progressed from childhood to manhood, Luke tells us that he grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. To seriously follow the master, Jesus, is to follow a self-imposed discipline that will lead to spiritual maturity and effectiveness in Christian service. Each of us can and should be making progress in that direction. Earlier, I mentioned some of the most popular resolutions. Let me finish with a list of resolutions prepared by Reverend Walter Schodel. He calls them seven ups for the new year. No, this has nothing to do with the fizzy drink. These seven ups fall under the heading of attitudes and actions. The first is wake up. Begin the day with the Lord. His day. Rejoice in it. The second is dress up. Put on a smile. It does improve your looks, believe it or not. It says something about your attitude whenever you smile. The third is shut up. Watch your tongue. Don't gossip. Say nice things. Learn to listen. The fourth is stand up. Take a stand for what you believe. Resist evil. Do good. Number five, look up. Open your eyes to the Lord. After all, he's your only saviour and only hope. Number six, reach up. Spend time in prayer, 
with your adorations, confessions, thanksgivings, and supplications to the Lord. And finally, lift up. Be available to help those in need, serving, supporting, and sharing. Whatever our hopes and aspirations for the year ahead, we should do well, we would do well, to make it our goal to follow the Master. And in the words of Peter, to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Let's join together in prayer. Let's pray. Loving Father, as we begin a new year, enable us to make it our goal to follow you through thick and thin. Whatever this year may hold in store for us, help us to keep our eyes firmly fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith that we might grow in grace and knowledge and be a blessing to those around us in the year that lies ahead. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we, pray, as we prepare to share in the Lord's Supper, uh, we're going to sing our next praise, Hear the Call of the Kingdom. Just over a week ago, we celebrated the birth of God's Son, Jesus Christ. But having done so, we now take time to remember why he came into our world. 
The Apostle Paul puts it like this in his letter to the Romans. You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For if we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him. For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more having been reconciled shall we be saved through his life? The one born in Bethlehem was destined to die for the sins of the world so that the relationship between us and God that had been broken by sin could be restored. And the one who made this restoration possible invites us to share in this sacred meal today. Not long before he faced the torment of the cross, Jesus met in a room with his closest followers. The Apostle Paul reminds us what happened that night in his first letter to the Corinthians. The Lord Jesus, in the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So we are invited to come and share in this act of remembrance. But as we do, we must also heed the apostles' warning. Paul continues, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. We don't come to this table today because we are worthy. We come because we are unworthy. The invitation to share in this holy meal is open to all who recognize that they are sinners in the sight of God and that Jesus died that their sins might be forgiven. Those who have trusted in him as Lord and Savior are invited to share now in the bread and wine. But we must always be sure to examine ourselves before we come to this table so that we don't eat or drink in an unworthy manner. This is the Lord's table. He invites us to come and share the feast he has prepared. But first, we must confess our unworthiness and acknowledge our dependence on him. So let's join together in prayer as we do that. Heavenly Father, as we bow before you, we acknowledge that we have wronged you in many ways through our selfish thoughts, words, and actions. And so we come confessing our need of you because there's nothing we could ever do that would make amends for our shortcomings. We can only ask for your forgiveness and trust in your limitless mercy. As we come to your table again, we praise you for the love and grace that sent your son Jesus Christ into this world. And we thank you that through his death and resurrection, you've made it possible for us to be saved from the punishment we deserve. Forgive us if we have taken such grace for granted and drifted away from you. As we admit our failure to love you and live as we should, assure us of your pardon and restore in us the joy of your salvation so that we may be renewed in our commitment to live for you. And with that desire to go forward with you, we join together in prayer using the words your son taught us saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread, so I take these elements of bread and wine to be set apart from all common uses to this holy use and mystery. And as he gave thanks, let us to draw near to God and offer him our prayer of thanks. Let us again pray. Gracious Father, we praise you for making it possible for us to be part of your family, the church, and for the sense of unity you bring when we trust in Jesus. We thank you for the love and acceptance you have shown through him and the very real friendship we have with you through all he has done. 
as we meet together at this table, we know that he is here among us by his spirit to help us and encourage us. And we thank you that as we share this meal, we can experience something of the fullness of life that he promised. As we share in the elements that speak of his sacrificial death, may we be thankful for the new life he offers. And so from this moment, may our commitment to you and your ways be strengthened so that through our lives, you may be glorified. For it's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. When Jesus had given thanks, he broke the bread and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Jesus said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes.
body of Christ broken for you. of Christ broken for you. blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Christ shed for you. Let us join in prayer. Let us pray. Lord, we praise you for coming to us in Christ, for the gift of salvation that is ours through faith in his finished work on the cross. Thank you again for the bread and wine that speak of his sacrifice and for the reminder that you love us with an everlasting love. To bow before you, we take a moment to remember those who are in need of your help just now. We pray for those for whom this past year has been particularly difficult. We think of those who have had to endure physical or mental illness and ask that they would know your healing touch. We pray for those who have experienced bereavement this past year, asking that you would comfort them as they continue to adjust to life without their loved one. At this time of economic uncertainty, may those struggling with financial problems be enabled to reach out to you in faith and the knowledge that you are more than able to provide for all their needs. We think of those who are far from home and ask that you would bless them with good health and faith so that they may be open to your guidance in all they seek to do in the year ahead. Lord, help us to put the failures of the past behind us 
and to focus on the future that will fall within your sovereign will and purposes. In the year that lies ahead, may our focus be on growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. We stand to sing our closing praise, the last two verses of the 23rd Psalm. Let us stand and praise God as we sing. close with the benediction. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.